Good morning, my name is Arash Padidar. I'm one of the neurointerventionalists at Regional Medical Center. Thank you for coming um, and watching this video. Uh, hopefully we'll have more videos in the future to show you. The intent of this is to tell you a little bit about what a comprehensive stroke center does. Uh, since ischemic stroke is a large portion of it, a lot of the topic today will be this, uh, about that. But comprehensive strokes uh, deal with uh, hemorrhagic strokes, ischemic strokes, uh, tumors of the brain that we have to uh, preoperatively embolize and uh, prior to resection, spinal uh, uh, pathologies that we deal with, and a whole uh, other set of uh, congenital and uh, pediatric issues and uh, traumatic issues that we deal with. So uh, there's a lot more to it. Stroke is just one part, uh, and hopefully you'll get a flavor today. So, so uh, at Regional, uh, when we first started this, the only place was at Good Samaritan, and the uh, Joint Commission and everyone thought, well, how could you have two stroke centers? And here we are, and we've become the busiest place. And with trauma being here, uh, these two things go hand in hand. A lot of times you will see a patient in the field and they're laying there and you have no idea what's going on. And uh, even after they come here and we work them up, we have no idea what's going on. And so um, it is better to take a patient to a center that is probably ready for all sorts of disease processes. If you take someone to hospital A, and they cannot uh, take care of the whole menu of things that the patient may have, then uh, the patient may lose valuable time and you will have to put that patient back on the rig and t transport them to another place that does this stuff. So stroke uh, is pretty bad. I hope none of you or your family get it, but if you live to the age of 65, cardiologists are doing a great job. The number one cause of uh, death after the age of 65 is stroke. So uh, it's something to know a little bit about, know some of your signs uh, of what a stroke is. Uh, basically not moving half your body or inability to speak or see passing out. There's a lot of uh, different variations, but please uh, bone up on that one. It happens all over this country. The South is uh, prevalent, and it's just because of our good old uh, American lifestyle. So basically, uh, we'll uh, make it simple, and there's the bland ischemic strokes, and uh, you have a blood clot that goes uh, in and closes that blood vessel, and there's different variations of that. We'll speak about that. Then there's the bleeding type, and then uh, of, of the bleeding type, there's a special kind, the subarachnoid hemorrhage that we see. The subarachnoid hemorrhage can be uh, from trauma. We see that common. Or it could be from a ruptured aneurysm, which is uh, the type we deal with and going in from the groin all the way to the brain and putting little slinkies. Uh, Trauma, uh, even though uh, gives you subarachnoid, doesn't cause all the problems that uh, berry aneurysms do because the blood is in a different layer. It's in the subpeal layer, and we'll get into that la later. Huh? So this is a stroke. This is a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, intraparenchymal, and you want to go to a center that can handle this. A comprehensive center has an ICU that has neuromonitoring, and they can, uh, on top of having a neurosurgeon who can rapidly put in a ventriculostomy or do a decompression, they can monitor all sorts of uh, uh, things at the bedside, such as uh, pressure, tissue oxygenation, and other parameters. And the nurses in the comprehensive stroke center at the, in the ICU are uh, uh, more geared towards it. They study a lot more to know uh, about the pathophysiology. So uh, that's where I would want my family to go. Uh, there's the, this kind. So there's blood. And it's in the uh, basal ganglia, and it extends into the ventricle. So this is an intraventricular hemorrhage at this point. Uh, then this is the subarachnoid hemorrhage that we talked about. It's on the outside. And this causes havoc. 
and these patients need to stay in an ICU for two weeks and they're going through uh, basically a tornado for these next two weeks and uh, these patients can have cardiac issues, lung issues, uh, their ejection fraction may sometimes drop to 10% in a young female. So uh, if you take these patients to a regular stroke center, they're not equipped to handle some of these patients. Even though they may have a neurosurgeon who can clip the aneurysm, because they cannot handle the sequelae such as vasospasm, and uh, that's when the blood vessels spasm down and there's no blood going to that area, 30% of those patients die. And it's been well uh, shown that if you go to a hospital, that does not have a neurointerventionalist to treat vasospasm compared to a hospital that does, the outcomes are uh, much better in the hospital that does. That's another reason. So there's the bleed, and we want to avoid this. Sometimes there's an aneurysm at the brainstem, such as this case, and it's pushing on the brainstem. And as you can see, the brainstem is being pushed by this large aneurysm. Uh, and this can cause herniation onto the cerebellum. So uh, this is an emergency, and you need to be well equipped. Again, you probably see this from car accidents or people punching each other. Typically, it happens in boxers, the epidural hematoma. They get punched right here. The middle meningeal artery is right here. And this is an arterial bleed, and it's a massive, rapid expansion of uh, blood outside of the brain, and people can die within a half hour uh, from this. And um, this is as opposed to a subdural hematoma, uh, which is usually the venous system. And uh, you have a little bit more time. Both are deadly. Both need drainages. Um, again, knowing to take a, p a person to a comprehensive stroke center makes a difference. All you'll see is a patient found down. There's no clinical uh, manifestation to know w which one it, it is. And uh, going to a comprehensive stroke center means that these people are triaged much faster. And if you have an epidural, you, it, it could make it a difference. On a CT scan, that subarachnoid that I showed you looks like this. It's just blood everywhere. All that white stuff that you're seeing is blood, all of here and here and here. And uh, so these patients, then when we have this, we do special CT scans uh, with contrast. It's called a CT angiogram. Different than an angiogram that we go from the leg all the way up. So there's CT angiogram, that's a CT scan with contrast. There's MR angiogram, and then there's a regular angiogram confusing enough. Okay, then this is what you guys see, the contusions. This is uh, from trauma, car accidents, and uh, uh, wife hitting the husband over the head with a skillet. And uh, so you can see areas of bleeding and shear injury from deceleration injuries that they have all over. These people definitely, even though they're a trauma patient, they need to be in a neuro ICU setting. Their outcomes are tremendously different between a trauma center that has comprehensive abilities than a center that doesn't. So what is TIA? You probably see this all the time. And you have a grandma suddenly has numbness, tingling, and weakness in one body part, or visual blindness, or something like that. And it goes away. Well, that is a warning sign from above that something bad is going to happen. Most people don't ha uh, have those signs. They're not lucky enough to have a TIA. They just go and have a full-blown stroke. Please, please take these uh, patients seriously. Please take them to a comprehensive stroke center. There's a complete different workup for these people. They're kept in for 24 hours. Uh, and uh, we do a full cardiac workup with, uh, with echoes and, and, and rhythm checks. We do carotid workup, and we do vascular workup by MRI, MRAs of their brain and CTs. So uh, this is a completely different way of managing these patients. And then they are plugged into the system, sent home with aggressive medical management, and uh, uh, then followed up by specialists. and. Um, if you don't do all of this stuff timely, 
the person may have a stroke within the next week and we miss that opportunity. So a TIA is a big deal. So uh, if grandma is home and she says, oh, I am feeling much, much better when I had these events, insist on bringing them in. So back to uh, making it simple about ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, one is a blood clot and one is bleeding uh, under different types. I kind of put this together to try to talk about ischemic stroke, the distribution of diseases and where it comes from. And uh, it can come from anywhere. It can come from the heart. So uh, it can actually have a hole in the heart and it could be a blood clot from a DVT that travels up called the paradoxical emboli. So it could even come from further. But uh, a lot of times, especially with the aging population, Atrial fibrillation is a common thing. 60% of the blood clots that I removed from the brain are organized blood clots. So that clot has been there a long time. And we're one of the first people or the first person to diagnose their arrhythmia. They were totally fine and now they're having a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So um, this is a very important thing to watch their rhythm uh, as, as you're bringing them in. And that should, should be your clue. If you're having TIAs and having rhythm changes, uh, uh, then that's a person you want to bring to a comprehensive stroke center. If they're having waxing and waning symptoms, those are really bad uh, signs. So please, please bring those per people. Please pay attention if the patient is having symptoms, what their blood pressure is. It could be that they're blood pressure dependent meaning that they have a bunch of blockages in their head, they've gone to their doctor, they've taken their blood pressure in the arm, and the blood pressure is 200 over 90, so they prescribe them a couple of more new blood pressure medications. They start taking it, their blood pressure becomes normal to around 130 over 60, and they become symptomatic and have stroke symptoms. Well, the brain is doing its correct job by jacking up the blood pressure to get more blood, and uh, we are, uh, counteracting all of those efforts. So knowing what the blood pressure is at the time of presentation is very important. If you're having an acute stroke, most of the time your blood pressure goes way up high. Uh, so we need to bring that down, that's okay. Uh, but a lot of these people, the blood pressure is going down. And make sure you, if you have time, or sometimes you don't, to take the blood pressure in both arms. Uh, the higher one is the correct one. Now you can have variations up to 10, 10 millimeters of mercury. But you can see from here that uh, there's a lot of places. You can have cryptogenic stroke, which we call these small vessel strokes. You can have, uh, well, these are the large vessels. When we talk about LVO, large vessel occlusion, we're talking about the circle of Willis area. And these vessels are two to three millimeters. They're not really large, but compared to the rest of the brain, compared to these, uh, lenticulostriate vessels, they are large. The aortic arch is a big area, and then the carotid as well. In the Anglo population, if you go to Texas, you see a lot of carotid disease. You, here, because we have a large Hispanic and Asian population, we see a lot of posterior fossa disease and, and intracranial disease. So you go to the East Coast, intracranial stenosis is uh, also called ICAT, intracranial atherosclerotic disease, is rarely seen. We see a ton of this, and we uh, do angioplasty and stenting of these patients, which is unheard of in the East Coast. That's because we have a different population. So, uh, so the diseases are different. So no longer do you go to a primary care and they do an ultrasound of your carotids and say, oh, you're fine. You really have to work these people up with further imaging. This is where the comprehensive stroke centers come. Also, these patients get different types of uh, strokes. They get more hemorrhagic strokes, much, much more than uh, Anglos do. So completely different pathophysiology. Stroke gets more as you get older, uh, and uh, I'll get into it. it is just to give you an idea, a lot of uh, money is spent on stroke, and I won't get, go into this too much. Signs and symptoms, um, hopefully, hopefully, please know your signs and symptoms of stroke, all right? When in doubt, 
just consider it to be a stroke. Um, you, you'll do your normal glucose check, you'll give your Narcan and stuff. Uh, slap some oxygen on the uh, person, even though their O2 sat may be fine, uh, they have a lot of ventilation issues. Give them fluids uh, and make sure that blood pressure is high enough. You don't want it to be too low, you don't want it to be too high, so it's hard to know where, where is the correct area. But I, I would say if you don't know the patient, somewhere between 140 and 180 is probably, you can't go wrong there. Um, now, there's a lot of stroke mimickers. So uh, here, here's some, right? And you see all sorts of things. And uh, we don't know what is causing this patient's symptom. A lot of times the patient comes to a primary stroke center or a comprehensive stroke center and we give them IVTPA and it's one of these. Um, it could be just a migraine. Hopefully we won't give it to a brain tumor. But um, so uh, what do you do? Uh, does that mean that when the symptoms get better that the TPA worked? No, it was a different pathophysiology, but we're just dealing with statistics. Time is brain, so we want to deal with this quickly. Uh, risk factors is living in this country, the American diet. Just not doing the stuff that you used to when you were 18 years old. Uh, and obviously different parts of the brain do different things. Uh, you can uh, look at uh, some of these at your leisure. But uh, we, we talk about eloquent areas of the brain. So sometimes you can have a strategic hit in your brainstem that's five millimeters and it's devastating. Sometimes you can take out a very large portion of the brain and not much happens. And, I, and in us guys, you can take extreme large portions and nothing happens. So this is the distribution that I was talking about in Anglos versus Asians and Hispanics. Asians get a lot more hemorrhagic bleeds. Uh, if you go to Japan or Korea, you will see 50% hemorrhage, 50% ischemia. In the Anglo population, it's 90% ischemia, 10% hemorrhage. At regional medical center, it's closer to the Asian population that we see. So there's um, other things uh, and other subtypes of uh, people who have higher diseases. I can tell you that I, if I see a Vietnamese uh, short stature patient come into my office with TIA symptoms, I can guarantee you that their basilar artery is one or two millimeters versus three to four millimeters. They're just born with smaller posterior fossa blood vessels. So uh, there is other uh, things and, uh, and um, where you live matters and how, how old you are and so forth. But this is something that a lot of people use on their slides. Look at this. An average stroke in one second, you accelerate your aging. Look at the first column and last column. In one second, you accelerate aging about eight hours. By one minute, three weeks, one hour, three years. An average stroke makes you 30 years older. I want to say something to how important you guys are. The impact that all of you as EMS do is far, far greater than what I do or what we do at the hospital. And here's my rationale. If you believe in these numbers or something about it, um, it is we, we at our hospital calculate door to recanalization time, meaning the time it takes the patient from arriving here to us opening the blood vessel. And we're he held to certain standards, and uh, every year that, that uh, length is becoming smaller and smaller. However, the, the, nobody counts how many minutes or hours it takes from the time of their stroke, which is the ictus in Latin, to the time they're brought to the hospital. And this may make the difference. So if they're in a rig and the guy is stopping and getting uh, uh, his uh, local newspaper, I'm just kidding, or, or taking him more importantly to a primary stroke center, total waste of time, total waste of time, and then finding out that they need to go to a comprehensive, we've already lost the battle. You guys uh, have all sorts of uh, uh, 
requirements of what to do, but uh, you will probably know which hospitals have which resources. And if you believe these uh, slides, uh, you make the biggest impact of all. So if the patient takes hours to get to a facility to recanalize them, the game is over. So that 20 minutes difference or 30 minutes difference makes the difference. You know, when we are, when we are patting ourselves on the back that we did well, we're talking five, 10 minutes difference. So uh, uh, thank you to all of you. So um, here's an ischemic stroke. This is a bad one. If you look closer, you see plaque, and the plaque gets so small, and then you develop a blood clot. These are what we call the large vessels, and uh, this is the brain stem, and these blood vessels go to the brain. So this is the plaque, and as you can see, uh, this plaque can break off, and you can form clot. This can happen in the brain or the uh, heart, and it can obstruct a, a vessel. Similarly, you can have these plaques, you can have platelet plugs, and then eventually the whole blood vessel closes. And when a thrombus or a blood clot breaks off, it can block something or it can travel up north and, and close a blood vessel up higher. This is the big one, atrial fibrillation. So this is when the baggy heart uh, just keeps uh, pumping irregularly and over time you develop blood clots and as you can see in the left atrial appendage uh, there's a pocket in there that you can have clots sit and eventually this clot can travel as this uh, pictorial shows and it goes up to the brain and this is what we commonly see this is the LVO or the large vessel occlusion that we have and it goes and gets stuck somewhere Usually it's the middle cerebral artery or the anterior cerebral artery because a lot of the blood flow goes there. As it goes up there, then you will have lack of blood flow to a certain area and the area dies and it's called infarction. The collateral flow, which is the side branches, keep some parts of the brain alive. So, uh, but it's not enough blood and we call that the penumbra, okay? so. Uh, this penumbra, as this shows, is this dark area here. Sometimes, the, so in this case, the clot, this stroke is big, and the penumbra, or the salvageable brain, is small. Sometimes it's the opposite. There's a small stroke and a large area that has a penumbra, or ischemia, or salvageable. So what we want to do is save that part. And if we drop the blood pressure too low, then even those side branches aren't enough to keep that part of the brain alive. The best is to get the patient quickly to the lab. So we want, that's why I think fluids and oxygen are a good thing to do. We can make fun of all of this and uh, we have people in the room who are watching this and I really want to address that this is an emergency. Uh, if you had a patient uh, that basically had an arm dislocated or amputated. You, you know, all your uh, EMS uh, you know, uh, buttons are pushed and you start really triaging these patients fast and you take them to the right center. If you have a huge laceration in the carotid and blood's pumping out, you would do the same thing. You would call all your buddies to come and help and you would get that patient or patients to the hospital. Stroke is the same. Look at this. A blood clot comes somewhere and gets stuck and no more blood flow up, up above. Now that patient may be sitting there and not screaming or anything, but it is the same effect as this uh, picture with the mannequin shows. There's no oxygen or blood getting there. So I recommend that we all take it seriously. And uh, even though your colleagues, and it could be that you go to the hospital and that emergency room is not taking it seriously. That person needs to get into the CT scanner as soon as possible. So again, time is brain, and uh, uh, hopefully you can take them to the correct place. So sometimes uh, when you have a stroke, uh, 
uh, several percentage of them turn into a hemorrhagic stroke. So you can see here, after a few days, the CT scan is normal, and eventually they have a bleed. So the, there's a hemorrhagic conversion, and that happens because the blood vessels become fragile. And again, here's the different uh, bleeds. And sometimes when a person comes, uh, we uh, completely change the outcome of that patient, even though we cannot save that brain. As this picture shows, the, a few days later, you have a large infarct. And as you can see, the bone is missing. A neurosurgeon has done a decompression and taken the bone flap off to let the swelling go away, and then eventually they'll put the bone flap back on. Now, we don't do it for all types of stroke, but in the non-dominant uh, area, if we do this, it will make the difference between life and death. Because if you had the bone here and this had swollen this much, it would have shifted uh, the normal brain and uh, the patient would have not made it. So uh, what is a CT angiogram? Uh, it's a, basically a CT scan with contrast. And we look for all different uh, blood vessel uh, uh, signs. We also do a CT perfusion. And a CT perfusion is a, a fancy CT angiogram. And we do it over time. And we get color images. And it'll tell you if that area is dead or if that area is alive but not getting enough blood. So CT perfusion is a very important uh, piece of technology. So uh, every patient that we do at a comprehensive stroke center, at regional medical center, we do the trifecta of a CT scan, a CT angiogram, and a CT perfusion. Soon as you bring that patient and goes into the CT scanner, they have all three done. From that, the pictures are sent uh, automatically to all the doctors on call on our iPhones. So we get a, a beep that, uh, that we have pictures. It is actually dummy proofed, and it'll tell you that there's a stroke, and it's a positive stroke with an LVO. So we will get a different thing. So uh, this has made a tremendous difference. These patients are now uh, you know, treated much faster, and we can quantify how much of the brain is alive and how much is dead. So for example, in this case, you can see uh, there's different columns that we look at, but basically going from right to left, what we want to uh, see is there's an area uh, that is suspicious, that there's not enough blood getting there, but eventually over time it, nor uh, it, it does become better. Not completely, you can see there's some areas that are still uh, not getting better. So if an area does not get better, uh, we call that dead brain or infarct. If an area uh, does improve and is reversible, that's ischemia or penumbra, different words for it. It's very similar to a Sestamibi scan or a thallium scan in the heart. So this is an MRI, the DWI. We do this often as well. We do this commonly for transfer patients. Um, and uh, it will show a stroke up to a minute. CT scans may take a few hours to show a stroke. But an MRI is, is much more sensitive. However, you can't put everyone in an MRI machine. In a comprehensive stroke center, we have uh, people on call for MRI tw every, uh, all 24 hours. So again, making the difference. You can do the same things with MRI. We can uh, do a perfusion, diffusion imaging to tell you exactly what that CT perfusion does, and in fact, Here's a picture. Green means it's ischemic or uh, you can salvage it. The purple uh, means it's already died. So you can already see that uh, there is more green than purple. So there's salvageable brain, there's penumbra. Maybe we should go take care of this person depending on the history. And again, this is where you guys come in. I don't have a clue who this patient is. You know who this patient is, you know where you pick them up, you know uh, maybe if they're a walkie-talkie, what kind of quality of life they've had, what kind of medications they're on, please, what their blood pressure was when this happened, and uh, maybe you have a point of contact uh, that can help us, and um, 
knowing that the patient has stage four lung cancer makes all of the difference, right? Uh, the, and um, knowing that the patient has a pulsed, th those things make a difference. And uh, so uh, we don't want to do unnecessary things or undesired things or, you know, against the wishes of their family. And that's where you come in. So you can tell us a lot. I mean, on the way to the hospital, you can say, I have a 45-year-old who was a walkie-talkie and, however, has breast cancer stage four and, you know, does not wish to have anything done. And um, we are going to take a different path on that patient versus I have an 82-year-old fully functioning person who's written their first novel and uh, uh, is going to ha has a severe uh, NIH symptoms, high NIH, and uh, wishes everything done. So two opposite uh, scenarios, but please uh, uh, let us know. You can call us with some of this information. Uh, and uh, the more we have, the more we can be prepared for these patients. So if they have a high NIH, uh, profound symptoms, that is a, a person I want to maybe take to the lab. And um, the other thing is cortical signs, uh, so, such as a gaze preference. If they're looking to the right, that tells you they are neglecting the left. That tells you the stroke is probably on the left side, okay? You look away from it, turn the other cheek like a good Christian. Um, so uh, I think th that's a big deal. Uh, if you have someone not moving their left side of the body and they're looking away, that's probably a large vessel occlusion. Please call us, tell us, I will activate the team, I will have them ready just like a trauma patient. That's what makes the difference. You, you guys are in the driver's seat, literally. So if we're doing an MR, we can do an MRA. All of this can be done in two minutes. We have a sequence that fast. We can see all the blood vessels and we can see what areas are dead and what areas are about to die. And it goes to our phone. So, but this needs to be done quickly. Now, uh, sometimes you have bleeds and these bleeds get bigger and bigger and bigger. And being at a comprehensive stroke center means how to manage these bleeds. Not all of it is managed surgically. Sometimes we manage these uh, medically by controlling their blood pressure, reversing their anticoagulation. Uh, please let us know the medications again because that'll tell us how to reverse it. Um, and um, talking to their family, knowing that they're a Jehovah's Witness makes all of a difference. Um, and so here we go. We have a patient who is, has a stroke. Their CT scan at one hour is pretty much normal. But uh, their CT perfusion uh, shows, uh, sorry, MR perfusion uh, shows that there's a large ischemia in the green and a large infarct. Should we go after this patient or not? That, uh, that is a, a, a question. This is an evolving stroke, very, very large. And unfortunately, these patients are not going to have a good outcome. So what does it take to be successful? Well, the more uh, your group and our group communicate, the better the success. I recommend setting up more of these uh, uh, discussions. But here, here's what it takes. You need to know what we can do, and we need to know what you can do. And it would be great if you guys can reach us. I've given you my cell number. We're on call 24-7. Please call. If you have questions, I'll answer it. Um, so this is what a biplane machine is, OK? And a biplane machine is two x-rays, one this way, one this way, OK? And we can turn it any way we want. So it's two planes. And uh, we have uh, one of the best ones. We went to um, Amsterdam. I met the CEO of Philips Corporation. And at that time, we bought the uh, top of the line uh, system. Uh, it can do all sorts of things. We have a huge, huge monitor. We can uh, watch uh, ESPN on the corner. Uh, but here's the kind of images you get. You can get rapid imaging from arterial to venous. And we can do all sorts of fancy stuff with it. And that'll tell us, basically, where the problems are.
Uh, we do aneurysm uh, treatments. So the neurosurgeons that do open surgeries do clipping. They'll put a staple across at the base of the aneurysm. I do coiling. Same way we do the strokes from the groin. We go in and stuff slinky coils in it. And uh, our machine can do all sorts of things. It can do a CT scan. It can do a CT perfusion. Soon we will be having uh, processes to take patients directly to the cath lab and bypass the ER, similar to a STEMI patient. Uh, it can be used for all sorts of tumor uh, uh, imaging. Uh, and you can combine all of these uh, modalities together. Um, so this is the kind of thing you can do uh, on an angio biplane unit. On the left is a CT perfusion from a CT scanner. On the right is a perfusion from a biplane machine. It will give you similar image, uh, information. And uh, so we can do a non-contrast CT on the table, we can do a CT perfusion on the table, and then based on their history and clinical exam and this information, we can decide whether we should cath catheterize this person right then and there. We can give them the IVTPA right there. The neurologist can be evaluating the patients at the same time. So it'll save, uh, save the patient time and brain and uh, all of this uh, cannot be done unless this patient comes to a comprehensive center. So this is the other kind of uh, neat stuff we do. There's a, this is a micro catheter. It looks like a little, tiny little spaghetti hair size catheter. These are stents. This is an aneurysm in the brain. This is the background bone. We can subtract all of this bone and blood vessels out to be left with a stent and a catheter in it. We can get so de well uh, uh, re high resolution, we can even see the struts in the stents. So we can use uh, these stents uh, for uh, uh, planning uh, of treatment of aneurysms. Sometimes we have wide neck aneurysms and we put coils in it. The bottom line is we want to prevent this. You, you all go to nursing homes and you see how many patients are there. And majority are there because of some kind of stroke uh, disability. And this is again the CT perfusion just to show you there's an area that's abnormal, it becomes normal. This is ischemia, this is reversible. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. This person needs to be treated. So depending on the clinical history. So here's your choices. You can do what we used to do for many years, is I sprinkle some holy water and pray for them to get better. We can give them IVTPA or throw all the newest technology at them or a combination of all. I would want my family to go to a comprehensive center that can do it all. And uh, we are expensive. We have a lot of toys that we need. And the more toys and technology you have, the better you do. This is that biplane machine that we talked about again. Here's one x-ray machine, and here's the second x-ray machine. Uh, and uh, so the patient comes into the room, and we lay him there, and we start taking x-rays. And uh, so we have all sorts of toys. We have rooms of toys and catheters and balloons. And so we have so many toys, sometimes we don't know which side is up. It gets complicated. Um, and we have all sorts of blushes and snares and lasso devices. All of it is to either open up that blood vessel or if it's bleeding, close that blood vessel. Uh, and uh, so there's been many, many toys that have come and gone. We're involved in a lot of clinical trials and research. That's another part of, that you have to do. For example, what the ECOS catheter does is if you have blood clots, we use this, by the way, in lungs as well for pulmonary embolisms, uh, larger ones. You can put a catheter, and you can be dripping TPA, the liquid draino stuff, to uh, bust the clot. And you turn on the ultrasound. So this is uh, agitates the blood clot and dissolves it much faster. So these small like catheters can uh, have ultrasound in it, plus the, the vibration of that, plus the TPA. It'll all work to uh, dissolve the blood clot. Then we have all sorts of suction devices. Uh, basically, uh, this is a penumbra device. And it's got a little uh, inside uh, catheter. We call it the separator. 
Think of it when you have a milkshake, you know, the clot come, uh, the milkshake is at the end of the straw and uh, you can't pull it up. So you basically either with the straw break it or push forward to break it and then uh, try to drink it. This separator kind of does similar to that. And this is a pump that all the clot can be retrieved. These things, once they're on the table, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to open up the blood vessel. So the hard work is to get them there. Uh, the rest is easy. And so here is the penumbra. So what we talk about is the penumbra device. This person comes in with a CT scan, and this is what we call a dense MCA sign. You may see that. The blood clot is so dense you can actually see it on non-contrast CT. The rest of the brain looks good. And, and we take this patient to the cath lab, and here we go. You see the internal carotid artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery stops. Half of the brain here is not getting any blood. Using that uh, separator that we showed, these are before and after pictures, and uh, suddenly all these blood vessels are open. This happens in minutes. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the same uh, device. This one has a big balloon at the end of it that we leave here. So we can reverse the blood flow and do a suction maneuver with it. And we have a corkscrew device uh, uh, that uh, now has actually been replaced by newer and newer devices called st stent retrievers. One of the first generations uh, of the concentric device was a corkscrew device that makes sense. You go beyond the clot, grab it, and yank it out. So that's what we do. We, and, and we have a balloon proximal to it that we can use as a suction and re reverse flow. And actually, this is a case my partner did. And uh, this was a blood clot. This was the first in the US. Uh, the tip of the clot was in the basilar. And he removed it. And the patient was in his 40s playing football with his son. And he went into a deep coma. And, and he removed it. And then the patient wanted to go home the next day. So. Just to tell you, this is very old data, but it proves a point. Uh, we were doing a registry across the country, and we had Good Samaritan Hospital and Regional Medical Center in it. And uh, we, uh, they, uh, the company called us and said, we need to come and see you guys. And we said, why? He says, you're doing something different. Your outcomes are far different. So they came and sh uh, showed us the patient. The blue is, is the registry in the country. And, and this was a, close to 1,000 patients. And uh, the purple is us. And our patients were 10 years older in general, which is significant in, in our uh, type of work. Older patients generally don't do uh, as good. But we have proven in other trials that if you're octogenarians, and uh, you fit the bill, uh, you know, we should treat you and you can have a good outcome. We've done it and published our data also for nanogenarians, uh, uh, thanks to Karen de la Cuesta. You know, and and uh, so we wanted to do it for centurions, but we stopped. So these patients, check this out, were much older. They, their presentation with NIHs was slightly higher by a few points, which is significant statistically. Um, their recanalizations were, uh, what, 12% more? Their mortality was, uh, I think, significantly higher. We had higher mortality. But this, and I thought that was, at the first go, terrible. But look at this. Our outcomes, good outcomes, were better. That, and the most important is percent alive at 90 days with good outcomes. That means in three months, is grandma going to be independent or not? That's what really matters. And if you look at the country at that time, 45% of the country uh, uh, had good outcome versus, and this is old data. This is over 10, 15 years old. Uh, uh, we had two thirds of the patient have good outcome with old devices. And we were saying, well, why did this happen? And the only difference was this point, the recanalization rate. We didn't stop until we opened the blood vessel. And, and that goes to show you, you need blood to your brain. It goes back to you guys. You, if you don't bring them, all of this doesn't mean anything. So um, we need a team. 
if you guys can get them to us, hopefully we can open it, but you're the mo biggest impact here. So sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, we have other devices. Uh, here's a, uh, this is what a CTA shows, a blood vessel is closed. Here it is. And this is a stent retriever. These are the new devices. We don't use the corkscrews anymore. And this is a before and an after shot. This is a Trivo device. Now, if you look at these, these are from publications. None of these patients are a candidate for, t uh, for uh, thrombectomy. All of these patients, all of these patients were within one hour and received IV TPA. But when you did the imaging, it was dead brain, dead brain, dead brain, and so on. So um, we give the TPA because we don't have the time to figure it out at first. And overall, it does better. But uh, imaging will really, really improve your outcomes. In Europe, they take everyone to the cath lab. In this country, we treat 5% of patients. 95% uh, aren't being treated. This is the type of clots that you can remove. These are other versions of the clot. Here's a case in point of a patient uh, here that was, uh, uh, comes in, 84-year-old. The paramedics uh, bring them, was flaccid on one side. Uh, the county MS uh, was called. The patient was brought in. And here's the timeline to revascularization. The clot was removed. Door to CT scan, 60 minutes. Door uh, CT to TPA, 36 minutes. IV TPA to groin puncture, 34 minutes. So, and this is old, old uh, slide. So what do you do when the CT is normal, MRIs? We, we have, we, sometimes we can't find a blood clot, but the patient's having a symptoms. Here's a case. We've been involved in other trials that uh, basically, this is like an intra-aortic balloon pump, similar to it. We put one balloon above the kidney, one be uh, balloon below the kidney, and you try to get perfusion to the brain and not cut off the perfusion to the kidneys. And that had some benefit. And here it is. Not all comprehensive stroke centers are the same. We treat some of the complicated stuff. We treat tandem lesions. Someone has a carotid dissection and then has a clot here, such as these pictures show. We tackle those. A lot of comprehensive stroke centers don't. They write them off. And yes, you have higher complication rates, uh, but you can still have good outcomes too. What do you do about a 22-year-old kid? This is years ago when Microsoft was shipping people here from Asia to do all the computing work. He came in. This is 15 years ago that I put this wingspan stent in this kid at that time. And I talked to him every year. And he's still doing fine. And, and he had a blockage and narrowing here. He didn't have a clot. He had a narrowing. This is the ICAT that I was talking to you, intracranial atherosclerotic disease. His was uh, from a herpes zoster. And what do you do about this patient, 50-year-old aerobic instruction, uh, instructor in Los Gatos? During class, she had an event, massive event. And you can see that she has a, a narrowing here. She has a penumbra. And we go and balloon it. There's no clot. And we stent her. So this is before, the top ones. This is after. You can see quite a difference. The MRI So a couple of small little hits here. And, and she's doing totally fine. This is a 38-year-old. Yeah, You can see comes in with small stroke and a large, sorry, it doesn't show well, a large area of ischemia. Same thing. We put a stent in her. She had a blockage here. You couldn't see. No blood was getting there. This is the MRI before, this is the MRI after, this is the CT perfusion before. And the patient doing very well. This is a 75-year-old, again, stenting is another thing. This is what comprehensive stroke centers do, and not all comprehensive stroke centers do this. We do these things called the Diamox Challenge. Sometimes, you know, we want, they, these patients don't have symptoms when they're sitting there. They only have symptoms when they're uh, being um, active. And so we give them Diamox, so CT perfusion is normal, but, and this Diamox scan will be abnormal. And we put a stent. And this is the patient in my office. You can see it's a long time ago. I had black hair. Mm. So th this is real. There's hemorrhage. 
and, um, and the circle of Willis is very important. I just want to end by showing you, I'm going to go very fast in it. Not all things are aneurysms. This is a traumatic aneurysm. Here it is. This is what it was from, okay? We, we treat, uh, sorry for the pictures, some of the, this is a post-radiation guy, carotid blowout, blood pouring out, and we treat these with covered stents. Uh, and there it is, uh, after the stent is placed. This is another patient who had a carotid blowout after a carotid endarterectomy. Here's the scar from it, it was huge. Again, we treated this. So, uh, uh, comparing ourselves to comprehensive stroke centers, even within us, there's different layers. So I, I think uh, amongst ourselves, we know who is who. Uh, there's about 400 of us in the country who do neurointerventional. There's clipping and coiling. This is a subject for an, uh, another lecture. Um, uh, these are slinky coils that we stuff in there. Uh, I would like you to kind of see this. This is uh, basically how it looks inside a plexiglass. And we just, uh, these are very soft coils that we put. Now you can see the aneurysm is much bigger than the neck. So the coils are st staying in there. What would you do if the neck was too large? This one it wants to pop out. So you could either use a, a balloon on the bottom to buttress it, or you can put a stent. Uh, but uh, this, this is uh, uh, kind of what it's like. This is the balloon version, or this is the stent version, right? Think of a, the, the, the coils are like a little kid in, in, in a crib wanting to get out. We put stents everywhere in the body. I, I love this picture. And we do pretty much all of this at regional. Um, and so these are specific stents for us. But we have 3D images of these that we can rotate. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's like Nintendo or uh, PlayStation. Um, and we can, after we coil them, uh, we can see this in 3D. Uh, so there's different stents that we have uh, for this. Okay, basically, here's the stent, and then we go in there and we put the coils. Makes it look easy, right? And this blood, uh, this aneurysm is two millimeters. Then we have other devices. This is like a liquid lava uh, that we can sometimes use, uh, uh, called onyx, uh, for treatment of aneurysms. And then we have a flow diverter. This is kind of cool. This is, um, this is a stent. It has mesh. It has a mesh in it. So you would put it across the aneurysm. So if you have an aneurysm that's untreatable, has branches, how do you treat it? These people would die. So look at this one. This aneurysm is a fusiform aneurysm. It has branches. So the idea is when you put this stent uh, flow diverter, it will close all the, throm uh, the aneurysm, but the branches would stay open. It's magic, really. And it's, it's like a cheesecloth. I mean, the pores, sorry, sorry, the pores in it are very, very small. And, um, and basically, it diverts uh, 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 blood, and, it, and it's here from the airplane uh, 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 fluid dynamics. And uh, basically, uh, this is the kind of aneurysm that was before untreatable. These people would die, all of them. So, and we take the same kind of uh, science that we have for airplanes or tornadoes, and uh, we can evaluate this. And software is coming up now that you can, uh, it'll be out in the next couple of years. I've been saying that for 10 years, you know, uh, that um, we can look at two MRIs, two people with a three millimeter aneurysm, and I can say this one is more likely to rupture than this one because of the way the blood is coming in into it. And, with, uh, and, and th this is what they're doing. You know, they can look, quantify all sorts of parameters in it to tell you this. So uh, these are untreatable uh, aneurysms before, and now we have uh, uh, plugs that we can put in these and close them. Uh, now, uh, this is, uh, uh, so this is the before, this is the after. And uh, similarly, this is the before and this is the after. And then uh, this is spaghetti. 
the arteriovenous malformations. People who come, again, a, a regular stroke center cannot do this. It's a waste of time to go there. Uh, and uh, you have to have a group of us that work together. And basically, this is an AVM, and this is an onyx, that, that liquid lava that we put in, that is in this patient's brain. And you can see all of this onyx that is in there. So I hope you have a glimpse of what we do. I can't do it, we can't do it without you. You guys rock, and I want to thank you. You guys, um, we don't see each other a lot, but uh, it, uh, and the patients I know never thank you. They never know who picked them up and brought them here. So I want to thank you for that. And uh, you're the most important part of this, by far. And so your choices of where you take patients make a huge difference. And call me whenever you want. Thank you.